Lieutenant Colonel Alexander L. Zlayton, United States Army Air Corps, World War II. Folks, Al Zlayton was a prisoner of war. He was shot down over Germany after his 36th mission as a P-47 Thunderbolt fighter pilot in World War II. 36 missions, he gets shot down and he tells his story in this interview of how he survived that. If you can imagine being shot down and then taken prisoner of war and how he survived it all. Lieutenant Colonel uh, Zlayton is just a wonderful man. He really inspired my heart when I interviewed him. It was April 8, 2007. I was in Longmont, Colorado, and I was interviewing other veterans. You just saw Rod Lawrence's story. That was during that time. And Al's no longer with us. He passed away 2010. He was 89. He was 85, almost 86 when I interviewed him. And But he left a legacy. Boy, did he leave a legacy. He talks about combat. Uh, as a fighter pilot and what that is and what that feels like, what that looks like and sounds like. And I just love these stories. This is a precious, precious, rare story. And a big heartfelt thank you to John Kuhn. John, attention sir, thank you, thank you, thank you for sponsoring Al's story. Uh, John is a great friend of mine. Um, he's just a supporter of my work and has passion for our veterans and our country and just a great guy. And I love you brother John. Thank you again for making others aware of what happened in World War II with Al's story. Folks, if you'd like to sponsor a story like John, there's information in the video description below my video. In the comment section of my video, you can donate to my work. So if you go to comment, which I wish you would, comment on these videos, you'll see the first comment is uh, the donation link. So you can also go to my website, LarryCapetto.com. There's a link that says sponsor a vet. Click on it see the pictures of my veterans, include their name in the sponsorship, and I'll do the rest. Folks, we're fighting for the same freedoms in our own country that Al and many others fought for on foreign soil, and we can't let these freedoms go. You know, I'll tell you, the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, have become so real within me um, the last three years that we've been fighting, and a lot of people have given up on their freedoms, and these deaths and these casualties of war are not going to be in vain in my watch. So I'm, I'm here showing, sharing these stories because, because contained within these stories is why we're free, why we have our freedoms, and I think a lot of you know that. We need to get this across to a younger generation who knows nothing about freedom because they were born in a free country. And um, that's what is so important about this documentary series and why I love it, the educational value, the fact that history will be repeated if we don't learn from it, and how people in this country are trying to destroy our history. They're trying to weaken our military. Well, we're going to say no. We're going to fight back against the tyranny and we're going to take a stand. And these stories are a great way to do that. Grab a hold of these stories, share them with others, uh, subscribe to this channel. My radio station, Voices of History Radio, is going strong over now in almost 40 countries. It's double. There was 20 countries a few weeks ago. Now it's over almost 40. So it's getting out there. So listener support at Voices of History Radio. Check it out. You can download the app for free on the Google Play Store and in the Apple, Play, Apple Store. Okay. Did I forget anything? I hope not. Anyways, I bring to you Al Zlayton. He wrote a book. Did I say that earlier? He wrote a book called By the Grace of God. And I'll show you a little picture of that cover of that book right now. And I have a copy of that book. And it's just wonderful. wonderful. When a veteran gives me a book that they've written, I, I find that very, very valuable. And I cherish it. So if you want to get a copy of that book, By the Grace of God, Al Zlayton, you can find that on Amazon, I believe. So, Okay, folks, that's it for now. Thank you for watching and listening, subscribing, sharing these stories. Let's keep it going. I've got a lot of videos in my archives, a lot of stories that want voice. And you can help me give voice to these veterans. Amen. God bless you.
War II. World War II. Okay, Al, tell me what year you went into the military. I enlisted in 1943. What branch of the military? Air Force, or the Air Corps. Air Corps, Army, Army Air Corps? Army Air Corps. And what was your job in the Air Force, or Air Corps? I was in the, uh, the cadets, and that, that's what I enlisted in. Mm -hmm. So what kind of work did you do in the Air Corps? Were you a pilot? I was a pilot. What kind of aircraft did you fly? P-47 Thunderbolts. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Where did you go to training for that? The Western Training Command. Where was that? California, Arizona. And how old were you back then at this time, 1943? I was a senior at the university. I was 24 years old. And were you, did you feel a real sense of duty to serve your country back then? Well, we were in a big war and practically everybody was gone. And I'd taken flight training at the university for two years, civilian pilot training. So that I knew I wanted to fly. I had over 100 hours when I went in. And so were you trained on the P-47 at that time? No, we started at the very beginning. Mm -hmm. Primary training, basic, advanced. I knew how to fly, but I, they didn't ask me and I didn't tell them. You know, as a cadet, you don't. You don't say anything but yes sir, no sir, no excuse sir. That's the way it was. So where did you go? Um, in Europe? Did you go to Europe? Yes. What month? Do you remember the month you went over to Europe? I think it was uh, August of 44. Of oh, 44, not 43? 44. Okay. So you missed the whole D-Day thing over there, right? Pretty much? Well, we got there right after D-Day. Where were you stationed or where was your base at over there? Well, we stayed a while in England at Atchum and then we transferred over to France and we were there a short time and the Germans were falling back and so they moved us to Belgium because it took too long to get from France to the, to the front. Once we were in Belgium, we could get to the front in five minutes. So, tell me about any bombing or missions. Did you have machine guns on the P-47? Tell me a little bit about the P-47, the Thunderbolt. Well, that was a big, heavy airplane, <coughs> very uh, durable, heavily armed with 850 caliber machine guns. It was, uh, at that time, it was probably one of the fastest airplanes we had. And if you wanted to get out of trouble, you just pointed the nose down and nobody would be able to follow you. You could outrun everybody. How did that differ from the P-51? The P-51 got all of the uh, publicity. It, uh, P-47 was over there for a couple of years before the 51 ever got built. See, the 51 has a, has a history that it's supposed to be an attack plane at low level work, but it was uh, liquid cooled. And all it takes is one hit in the coolant and the P 51 was done. And then uh, the P 51 was a, equipped with the Allison engine, and that didn't work too well. So then they put the Rolls-Royce Merlin in it, the British engine, and it did a lot better. But uh, we were close support. We helped the troops move. When they got in where they couldn't move, they called on the P-47s. It was originally designed for high altitude escort. But then they moved it down to the ground and that's where we did most of our work, with occasional escort duty. But, uh, you know, you take a, on a drive to the Rhine, when the army was held up by the, by the Nazis, they called on the Thunderbolts. 
and you get a squadron of thunderbolts going in there every 10 minutes, you get a pretty big striking force. And uh, just to give you an idea, I was on leave in, in Paris for two days. I was sitting next to a infantry sergeant. And he asked me, he says, well, where do you fly? I said, P-47s. He said, oh, do we love you guys. He said, let me tell you about a mission. And he started telling me about an early morning mission at a certain area. And the more he talked, the more I knew I was on that mission. And he said, he said, we took that whole village without a single casualty after you got through dive bombing and strafing. He said, the Germans were just sitting there dazed. He said, I gotta buy you a drink. So uh, we did a lot of close support work. Uh, so we weren't probably as glamorous as uh, some of the other planes, but it's strange that most of the pilots that are, had shot down the most airplanes were P-47 pilots. And it's a little bit chagrinning to, to have them give the publicity to all of the P P-51, where the 47s had a lot more to do with what was going on. So tell me about some of the missions you flew and uh, where you were at in, in, in encountering maybe German aircraft on those missions. Well, uh, the only time we encountered the German aircraft was they would try to come over and get us to jettison our bombs before the dive bomb run. But we finally countered that with putting one flight at top cover, and then they quit bothering us. They, uh, they would never attack us unless they had us highly outnumbered. Well, we didn't have a lot of difficulty with, with German planes. And I noticed that some of the people got a, a medal here because they had never lost a plane. But the records show they did lose a plane or two. And we escorted bombers and we never lost a plane. But that was, a, for us, that was kind of a milk run to escort bombers. And when you go in and dive bomb an area where they are having trouble moving on the ground, and then you have an air controller down there, maybe a pilot on the ground, telling you, we'll give you smoke, give you red smoke on the area they want you to hit. And then he'll say, would you strafe the area, please? Well, with eight 50 caliber machine guns in each plane, and you get 12 planes going down, you got a lot of firepower. And then when you get through with that one pass, he'll say, can you give me two more passes? Well, <laughs> that's, when the, that's when the things get tough because you're down close to the ground mm -hmm. and everybody with their BB gun and pistol are shooting at you. And then he wants us to do it two more times because see, you're right down to the ground when you're doing that. And that, that's a pretty ha hazardous thing to do. Mm -hmm. But uh, we did get results. Is it there a lot of adrenaline when you drop flying one of those planes? I mean, is it, are you on alert status all the time, or how do you feel? Oh, you, uh, after a few missions, you got the feeling that maybe you were going to make it. The group I arrived with, uh, we had, I think, uh, 14 replacement pilots to replace those we lost during the invasion. Mm. And... We had one eager beaver, you know, he wanted to be first. So they said, good, you can fly in the morning. And so they took off and we were sitting around there waiting for the planes to come back. And out of the 12, only 11 came back and we said, where's the other one? He said, well, he didn't make it. He went on his first mission and didn't make it. That's our introduction to combat flying. So, but uh, one of the things you do, everybody thinks the engine starts running rough as soon as you cross the front lines. But uh, 
You know you're going to get shot at. You do. You can see the flak everywhere. Uh, you know you have to dive bomb. You may have to strafe. Uh, you lose planes. Uh, it's it's a uh, it's a dangerous business. You you don't know when when you're going to be in trouble. Sometimes the weather is is your enemy. So you 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 don't know. Coming home, you get to the air the aerodrome and it's all fogged in and you can't see where to land. And uh, they light a fire for you on the airstrip. Somebody staggers them the wrong way and you start to land and you're not even over the airstrip. <laughs> so you, 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 may, you may get more danger trying to get, get home than you do over the, over the lines. And, uh, you, it's, you just don't know who's going to get hit and when. Your plane gets hit every once in a while, you get holes in it. Uh, but after, I don't know, 20, 15, 20 missions, you begin to feel like maybe you're going to make it. Now, did you get shot down? I got shot down on my 36th mission. Can you tell me about <coughs> that mission and what happened and just describe the, 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 the crash and why, why, what happened? Well, we were flying over the Rhine, near the Rhine River, and there was overcast. And I looked down between the clouds and I could see a motor convoy. I was leading the second element. Squadron leader said he didn't see it for me to go down and check it and see if it was one of ours or whether it was enemy. So I uh, told my wingman to follow me down and go check it. Well, I went down, but the wingman didn't, so I checked it out, and I said, it's enemy. And I pulled back on up, and he said he still didn't see it for me to lead the attack. So I told the wingman, let's go, we got to lead the attack. So I went down through the overcast and dive-bombed the uh, motor convoy, truck convoy. But I was the only one who went down. Nobody else came with me. And when I was a single plane down there, and the whole area opened up with 40 millimeters, and, and I got hit with 40 millimeters, and my plane started to burn. And uh, I've written a book about it. I have a copy here. Uh, when a thunderbolt starts to burn, if the flame gets into the turbo, it'll blow up in about 30 seconds. But if you bail out, the Germans on the ground would shoot you in the chute because Hitler had issued an order. See, this was in February of 45. He had issued an order that no airmen will be taken alive, especially B-47 pilots. So you don't want to bail out. And if you stay in, it might blow up. And then the engine quit, so you have crash land. So I crash landed behind enemy lines. And it took me uh, about four nights to get to the front. It was below zero weather, it was snowing. And there was no place to get any food. I mean, you're behind enemy lines. And so uh, it's yet to be pretty hazardous. Well, describe the crash. You're going down, are you? radioing anybody? Um, are, you, are you afraid? Are you freaking out? What's going on in your head? What are you, what are you doing? I mean, well, you don't have time to get too concerned because a, a thunderbolt without an engine doesn't keep you waiting very long. You're, you're losing altitude fast. And there was a clearing there in the forest and I landed, a crash landed in there. So, and it was just uh, to uh, Part of the story is there was snow on the ground in patches of snow. So I took out my compass and headed in one direction and then I jumped off on, I left a lot of tracks, dropped my parachute. Then I got into the dry area, went back to the plane and went in another direction. And in a matter of a few minutes, the motorcycle uh, troops arrived and they started heading on my tracks and then they couldn't find me. And, 
And I went through an arroyo and over on the other side into the forest. And that's how I got away initially. But uh, before I crashed, uh, our radar controller told me that I was 30 miles in, 30 miles behind the front. So I spent the next 12 days evading and getting up to the front. So were you scared? No, it's not a matter of being scared. It's uh, you have a, you get to the point where there isn't anything you can do. So if you know how to pray, you better pray a lot, which I did. And I got to the point where I couldn't do anything about it. I had to leave it up to the Lord. And he took care of me. And in my book, I describe where, where God's intervention, intervention saved my life about six times in less than a week. Uh, I lecture the kids at the schools and, and I talk to them. I give them one incident where I was, I walked at night mostly because you're behind enemy lines. They'll see you in the daytime. And I had crossed the river and I was walking in a dark area and I heard a voice coming out of that area and I changed direction. The next morning I found out I was walking into a minefield. And I asked the kids, I said, who was that, a German soldier? Some of them, oh yeah. I says, what would a German soldier be doing in a minefield? I said, that was the voice of an angel. Now I've had people scoff at me, but I don't really pay much attention to that because I was there. I was in a, I finally found a village and I was, was taking shelter in a small shed and I was wet and I'd been out in the cold for four days and uh, I fell asleep, which I hadn't done in four nights. I just catnapped and when I fell asleep, there was a big explosion in about several hours and that whole shed was blown away. I had no shrapnel wounds and no wounds of any kind. To me, that was the Lord waking me up because I was dying of hypothermia. And when I woke up, I was kind of disgusted. My hands and feet were frozen. I later lost all the nails on my hands and feet. So I had to find somebody else, someplace else to stay when I found another barn where I stayed. And there are other instances where where my life was saved by intervention of the Lord. There would be too many to, to tell you in less than a half hour. But uh, I have a copy of the book, you can read it. Right. Uh, there's no doubt, I'm, I'm going again uh, on the t next week, I'm going again to talk to high school kids and tell them, and I, uh, I tell the people around, I said, I'm going to talk about God and if you don't want me to talk about God, don't invite me to come. Because if there is no God, I don't exist. And I, above all people, should know there is one. Because when he saves your life within a week's time, he saves your life six times. And I, I got so tired of listening to people say, you were so lucky. Luck had nothing to do with it. And people know that luck is a matter of the theory of relativity, you know, the uh, probability theory. Mm -hmm. But if something occurs at a precise time, you put in time in there, that if I had gotten a warning 30 seconds late, I would have been dead. If it had gotten a warning a minute earlier, that wouldn't have helped. It had to be at a precise instant, things had to happen that saved your life. And that happened to me about six times. I, you see, I, uh, I was going into a building, 
next to the one I was staying at, hiding in. And I crawled in the window and just got inside the wall because I wanted to go see where I heard a cow in that barn. Mm -hmm. And just at that time, a young man walked in at the other end with a lantern. And right in front of me was a 10 foot wide hole where had a, a delayed bomb or shell had gone off and blew the floor up into these real sharp, this, you know, this flooring sticking up. One more step and I would have been in there and I would have been killed. But the boy came with a, in with a lantern. Okay, that's timing. Uh, it's things like that where that was the time I was scared. I mean, that really, that really took my breath away. Because one more step and I would have been dead. You see, and uh, then I, I was uh, I was captured after twelve days, and uh, I was interrogated. But uh, I was shaking so bad because of uh, exposure. In the, to the weather, and I hadn't eaten in 12 days, and uh, I was, my hands were shaking, uh, although my mind was very sharp. And these interrogators start answering their own questions. Did they say, well, did you come from England? Yeah, I said to England, because they knew we had airplanes in England. I can't, well, I wasn't going to tell them we were in Belgium just five minutes away, because I had friends back there yet. And they start answering their own questions, so I just let them answer their own questions. So, but uh, there, there were strange things. Then I, uh, after I was captured, I was taken in with a bunch of uh, wounded soldiers to a field hospital. And a doctor was going to interrogate me. And I told him, that's all, I can't. He asked me questions and I said, I can't, I can't tell you. And he said, I will see that you will tell me. Well, I felt he was threatening me, but lo and behold, about that time, we got an artillery barrage from the American side. <laughs> it just blew that place apart. And I never did see that doctor again. So uh, I told the Lord, well, it's, I'm glad you did something, but did you have to send an artillery barrage? But uh, I found favor all along the way. Uh, I survived. Uh, there were about six or seven times where I, where I could have been killed, but I wasn't. Amazing story. It's, uh, I know there is a God. I know he intervened. And... Uh, when I lecture to people, I look around, I can see the skeptics by the look on their face. But you know, that's okay. I was there. And I lived through it. And I know exactly what happened. And I wrote it in my book. So, How long ago did you write that book? Well, it's been out for five years now. I, I had a lot of notes. And I got so tired of hearing people say, you were so lucky. So my family finally, my wife convinced me to write the book. Did you publish it yourself? Yeah, I, could, I sent it to the big publishers, and since uh, my name was not very well known, they declined to publish it, so I published it. How many copies did you make? Oh, I don't know. I made about 600 at a time. Good. But I've, I've reordered it. It's in the fourth printing. Well, as far as World War II, how long were you in World War II? <clears throat> well, I was there from August of 44 until the, uh, about the end of April when we were liberated. And I was, I was on board a train going through Chicago on VE Day. What do you remember about VE Day? All I know about VE Day is that uh, I knew it was coming. I mean, they were defeated. But you didn't know when. Uh, 
All I knew is I was on the train going through Chicago on the way home with a bunch, I was in charge of a bunch of POWs that were coming to Colorado. And uh, there were people uh, along the way, uh, elevated in Chicago and they were all at the windows waving at us. So that's what I remember of VE Day. I, uh, I got home. I didn't get home. I got to Denver. I had to catch a bus to a little town. And uh, of course, nobody met me, you know. Nobody met me with flags waving or anything like that. Nobody even knew I was coming home. <laughs> I had to get on the phone and find a ride with somebody who would take me home. So and, uh, you were only over there for less than a year then, right? I was over there less than a year. Oh, I mean, what an amazing experience. You were a POW for how long? From the 60, the, at the end of April, the end of February until the 14th of uh, April. We were liberated on the 14th of April. Were you treated okay? I, I was treated very well. I was treated very well. In a, I was in a German hospital. What about Hitler's uh, order not to take prisoners? Well, they didn't get a chance to shoot me in the air. I didn't bail out. Did they know you were a pilot? Yes, I told them I was a Jaeger Flieger. Now, a Jaeger Flieger is the one who escorts bombers all the time. I didn't tell them I was a P-47 pilot that blasted the front every day. So they never knew what I flew because the plane that I flew was miles behind somewhere in the mountains. They didn't know what I flew. I was covered with oil and I didn't, and mud. I, I didn't even look like I had a uniform on. So they, they had no idea where I came from. I was 30 miles from where I got shot down. Any of your friends get shot down while you're over there during that time? Oh, yes. Were you with them at the time, or? Yes. Can you give me a story of what happened, maybe what comes to your mind when I ask you that? Well, we, uh, on occasion, you go out and usually in a, a squadron of 12, but sometimes it's a big mission and you get the whole group goes, that's three squadrons would be 36. Uh, we were just going on a squadron mission and we had a tailwind and we were getting over the front at a low altitude because we had a 50 mile an hour tailwind. And I was just about ready to call out to my friend who was leading it that we've got to orbit and get some altitude. Well, he was hit with a burst of four from the German anti-aircraft and it just blew up right next to his plane and he went straight down, straight in. Uh, on another mission, I was flying top cover and a friend, my friends were carrying napalm bombs, fire bombs, mm -hmm. over the front. And he was hit with flak and his plane was a blazing cross. And when you're flying a fighter, you don't have time to, come, to sit there and observe until a guy hits the ground or whatever he does. But I never saw him got out, but he did get out, I understand. And another guy, diving bombing too low, and he mushed into the ground and blew up. Uh, what happens on the radio when that happens? Do they, do they say, I'm hit, I'm going down, or what happens? Do you remember? No, I didn't hear him say anything, uh, especially when, when Leader got hit with four. I think he was killed in the cockpit. And this guy was on fire. He, he didn't have much time to get, he got out right away. And, you don't hear much. All I did was say, I'm on fire. That's all they, they knew. They thought I was going to bail out. Well, if you bail out, they'll shoot you in the chute. I have a copy of Hitler's order saying to do that. Great. See, I went over there th three years ago with the, my neighbor, Greg Klipstein, and uh, we got a copy of Hitler's order saying no airmen will be taken alive. Where did you go, over to France? Or? We went over to Frankfurt. Okay. 
Germany. And when we went up to, to France where we saw the D-Day area, of course, we, 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 that's where we came in right after D-Day. And we went to Belgium where the, air, where the air base was, where I flew. If I found a chateau, we stayed in. Tried to find a German hospital where I was, but they had converted it to something else. After 50 years, things changed. <laughs> so I was glad nobody was shooting at me while we were there. But uh, war is a nasty business. Uh, there's no getting around it. Uh, so how do you how do you unwind at night after a mission like that? Do you talk with the other guys? Do you drink beer? What do you do? Oh, well, some of the guys drank. Uh, I didn't did, didn't think drinking was a very good idea. Uh, we used to play uh, play poker, and and one time I was on a mission, and I was thinking about my poker hand of the night before, and I said, this is ridiculous. I'm over the front lines, and I'm thinking about last night's poker game. So that night when I got back to the base, they said, well, Pop, your, your chair's all ready for you. I said, I'm through. I never played again. You gotta keep your mind on what you're doing. That plane is, has to be flown. You're the only one in it. And you got the responsibility to your wingman, your responsibility to the man you're flying with, and uh, it takes everything you got. They called you Pop? Yep. Why is that? I guess it's because I took care of them. Mm. Uh, we, uh, we, were on, uh, we were on leave in, in Paris for two nights, and then we got fogged in. We flew in there with a transport and we went back to, to this hotel that the army had taken over and the uh, master sergeant back there says well you can't stay here your orders only say two nights well, we're fogged in here we got no transportation well I can't help that and it was about 11:30 at night and, and uh, the guys or about three or four of us started to they started to walk out, and I said, just a minute. I said, who's fighting this cotton picking war, us or him? And I went up to that sergeant, and I said, I'm giving you a direct order. Call your commanding officer. He says, well, it's almost midnight. I said, that's a direct order, and I'm going to write you up if you don't follow it. And he didn't know what's going on. I says, you got vacancies? And he says, yeah. I says, good. We'll take them. And so we had vacancies for that night. And I guess the guys start calling me Pop after that. But uh, there are things like that, you know, that happen. Do you, do you think about World War II anymore? Or is it like a long time ago? Or is it still part of your You life? never forget it. Uh, when we get back, from combat, you know, mentally, you'll never forget it. Uh, we get back and they call us, call us flak happy. That's what they called it now. Now they call it uh, this. Uh, post-traumatic stress. Yeah, post-traumatic syndrome. And it's real. Uh, I got married after I got back. And it was two years later that uh, we were sleeping with my wife and I smacked her in the stomach and knocked the breath out of her. And she was gasping for breath. And she says, what's the matter? The Germans have been chasing you again? I says, yeah. This is two years later. And people say, well, how do you remember all that stuff? That was a long time ago. You never forget. I would instruct a daughter of mine never to marry a combat veteran. He never f lives without that war. It'll be with him all his life. And these kids that are coming back, they are mentally not stable. And we've been dis disregarding that. And it's something that sh needs to be taken care of. And, and what their conditions they're going through are terrible. 
The guy smiles at you in the morning and he tries to blow you up in the afternoon. And the way we've been treating our veterans, I just, I just don't know about that. We can build bridges in Alaska and rainforests in Iowa, but we can't treat the veterans to what they deserve. I mean, that uh, irritates me no end. And to forget, uh, you don't forget everything dramatically, but you never forget it. You don't remember it. Uh, some of the details will come back to you later. But uh, I don't think you're ever completely the same. There'll be, you'll go months without thinking about it, and all of a sudden it comes back. And uh, you used to even, sometimes you even remember details you'd, that you thought you forgot. But it's a, it's a nasty business. Your, your life's in danger when you're in combat. The, you know it. What is war? You kill them before they kill you. That's, that's just putting it bluntly. Now, what should people remember about World War II? Well, they should remember World War II. Fifty million people died in World War II. People talk about, well, women and children are being killed. But of course, Dresden was bombed by the British at night when 100,000 people were killed. We had a lot of casualties during the invasion, but we had more casualties during the Battle of the Bulge in December of 44 than we did during the invasion, when Germany staged its last big drive. The casualties for the Air Corps alone were 50,000. Uh, everybody supported the war. What we're doing now is people are going out playing golf and we got kids getting shot up. And we're worrying about the price of gasoline and the corporations are making big money and and then only a few of the people are over there. The reservists are over there. They're being kept over there twice as long as they were told they'd be. The National Guard's being used over there. We don't have enough troops over there to seal the country off. Uh, obviously, Saddam had all kinds of weapons. Uh, we, know, we know that. It's just all political. Uh, I think this baloney about it but not giving the troops money. I think those people ought to be jailed instead of put, put in Congress. I mean, this is, and uh, we don't even know we're at a war. We either support it or don't be there. I mean, there's no two ways about it. We could have, uh, we could have, had enough troops, we could have surrounded the border and kept all of these insurgents out and let those people go ahead and fight themselves until they're through, and then we'd be all done with it. But we, we can't fight their war for them. Uh, uh, it's very appalling to me that, that uh, we're worried about hockey games and football games, the World Series, <laughs> and all everything else, these kids are getting killed over there. I mean, what kind of a nation are we? Do you think people are forgetting about World War II? Oh, I, I, yeah, most people, the only people who really remember World War II is those that were involved in it. Uh, the Vietnam veterans are upset because they were over there, and we shouldn't have never been in Vietnam. So I stayed in the reserves for 30 years, and I was the uh, executive officer of my unit. And I always argued with the colonel that we didn't belong in Vietnam, and we didn't. And uh, the Vietnam veterans were treated terribly when they got home. But nobody greeted me when I got home. Uh, 
we've got a lot of people that want to help these these people now. Well, I think the veterans organizations have been doing a good job of trying to help veterans. I belong to several of them. But um, it doesn't, the, uh, the regular run of the mill people are not supporting these, these kids over there. You know, they put a sticker on the trunk of their car and that's supposed to do it. But uh, that, that's not enough. Um, what sh but what should we re remember about the war? I mean, I, I kind of asked you that as far as... Uh, the, World War II? Yeah, hit the history of it or just well, lessons learned or... It was the biggest war in history. It was worldwide. Uh, like I said, 50 million people lost their lives. Uh, We, uh, we did what we thought we had to do. We were attacked at Pearl Harbor, but there was a lot of politics involved in that. There's politics involved all the time. The, uh, I think Washington knew the Japs were coming, but they didn't notify the general and the admiral in Hawaii. And uh, a lot of mistakes were made during World War II by certain commanders. They lost a lot of troops trying to do the impossible. For example, they sent a, a whole squadron of, of uh, medium bombers over these sub pens out of England over to, to Europe, low-level bombing so could, they could be accurate. Well, they were accurate, but they lost every bomber and aircraft. I mean, those kind of decisions. Uh, there were big raids pulled by, by heavy bombers without fighter escort, and the losses were very heavy. Uh, a lot of command decisions that were made were not very, very good. Now, just a couple more questions. What does the American flag mean to you as a veteran? Well, it represents this country and what we stand for. And I think that uh, we ought to respect the flag when it's flown. And this idea of uh, some people want to burn the flag or drag it on the ground or make a shirt out of it or what, I think it ought to be respected. I mean, that's if that, we have to have some symbol represent this country, uh, whether we're deserving of it or not. But uh, it's a country I fought for. And unfortunately, some of the things I fought for are now going down the drain. And uh, I, I'm not alone in this thing. Uh, I, I don't claim to be a hero. I've never, I've never claimed that at all. Some people have called me hero. I told them I'm not one. I did my job, and uh, that's all. Uh, some people say, well, you enlisted. Some people were drafted. It makes no difference. We were all over there. To me, that's the same thing. I enlisted because I wanted to be in the Air Force. And uh, whether you were drafted or enlisted, we both did our job. How old are you now? I'm 85. Do you ever dream about flying like you did before? If you could go back in time, I mean, do you ever, as an older man now, do you ever think about your, your younger days and the thrill of flying? Well, I think I get my thrill from watching the... Uh, exhibition by the Air Force Flyers. They do a great job. I mean, it, I, I, I appreciate what they do there. They're good. They're really good. How do you feel when you see that? And you remember the days you used to fly? Does your mind drift back in time or do you just... Oh, uh, the things that we did, uh, we, we were good at what we did. Uh, 
Some of us had more training than others. And some of us uh, were really not that good. Do you miss it though? Do you ever miss what you did in World War II? No. I don't miss flying at all. It, uh, I don't fly with the people with these light aircraft because after flying a fighter plane, well, it's kind of anticlimactic to fly in a light plane. I don't miss it. How about commercial airlines? Do you fly in them? I didn't fly for a long time after I got back. I didn't like airplanes. But then uh, in my work, I had to do a lot of flying. I flew by air. It, uh, it doesn't bother me to fly. Isn't there a degree of pride and even glory to do what you did as a fighter pilot or um, was it glamorous at all? I don't know. Uh, you know, each, each organization feels that they're, they're the best. Uh, I think fighter pilots have a certain amount of pride. We call the other boys the truck drivers. And uh, you, you have a certain amount of pride in your unit. I know some of the Vietnam helicopter pilots I've talked to, they say things like they were full of piss and vinegar. Yeah. And just, you know. Well, I had a friend who was helicoptered out of, out of uh, Korea three times, but he flew P P-51s. They got shot down. <laughs> because we gave away all the P-47s. No, it's a, uh, uh, I serve my God, I serve my country, I serve my family, I serve my city, but I'm sure I haven't done enough. I don't think you ever do. You have kids? We have four children. A lot of grandkids? Lots of uh, grandchildren, great-grandchildren. Did any of them ever ask you about the war? Well, they all read my book. Okay. They all read my book. Oh. No, you see, when you first come back, you don't talk about the war because you've got veterans all around you. You merely just say, well, where were you or what unit were you with, and that's it. So everybody was, was a veteran, it seemed like. Well, not everybody. Somebody had to stay home. Did you know the Lord back during World War II? Yes, I did. did you, were you at peace with the fact that you might die, but you'd be in heaven? I mean, did, did you think like that? Well, <clears throat> to me, uh, when you taxi out to take off, you got a lot of time to pray. And I don't, so there's no, uh, they say there's no atheist in the foxholes. I don't think there's any atheist taken off on a plane to go on a mission. So uh, I finally, when I got shut down, I turned it all over to the Lord because I was helpless to help myself. You're in a condition where there isn't anything you can do. And like I say, uh, I certainly do believe in the Lord, and I thank Him every day for His blessings and His favor and His grace, uh, because I would have never made it without Him. Yeah, I, could, I knew I wouldn't. Did you ever strafe the Germans, or were they just objects or um, targets? I mean, did you ever see columns of Germans walking and go down and shoot them and all that stuff? Not, never has uh, seen the columns because when we came over, they all took cover. Okay. They took cover. So when you did a dive bomb attack, they all ran like they do in the movies? And well, they better find cover mm -hmm. because uh, there's nothing as vicious as a P-47 attack. I mean, you get, if it's a group mission, you got 36 P-47s coming down with each, eight machine guns in each one of them. It's, it's a very destructive aircraft. How did you feel when you were firing that machine gun? Did you feel like, was there this power that came on you? or how you Well, the, uh, you see a gunner down there, and he's in a half track, and he's shooting at you. And you say, well, look, 
that's not very nice. So you go down and strafe him. Now, he's got armor plate down there he can get behind. And he keeps shooting at you, so you keep shooting at him until somebody quits. So, I mean, that's, that's what war is all about. Uh, How about other, you, sh you were shooting at half tracks, were you shooting at tanks, were you shooting at people, um, you know? Well, we're, sh we're strafing trains. Yeah? We strafe trains and... Drop bombs too? And well, you, you, what you do, you stop the train by shooting holes in it, and then you try to blow up what's on it. Maybe it's loaded with ammo, or you see trucks down there, you strafe the trucks. And, or you uh, usually have d troops that are dug in, and our artillery will give you red smoke on the target, and you better see where it is because it's, in just a matter of seconds, you're going to get red smoke over here on your side because the Germans will fire red smoke to try to confuse you. So you bomb where the red smoke is. The first red smoke. How many missions did you fly? I was on, my, thir I was on my 36th mission. Okay. That was it. Did you ever stay in contact with any of these other pilots over yes. the years? Yes, I did. Are any of them still alive? Uh, there are... Three of them still alive. That I. Where do they live? Around here? Uh, well, one, two of them in California and one in Mississippi. There was one in Alaska. He passed away. So I well, I talked to one on the phone just the other day. I've done several interviews with P forty seven and P fifty one pilots. That's what I was asking. So. Yeah, we we all belong to the P forty seven Pilots Association. We used to have re, uh, reunions, but there's, there's not enough of us left anymore. Yeah. Oh. Well, your story is amazing, and I'm looking forward to reading your book. And uh, Well, you'll get a lot more detail out of it. Yeah. Well, I just wanted you to take your time and, and tell me some things. And uh, Well, I didn't, uh, for me to give you a real complete story would probably take me an hour and a half. Well, we could even maybe do another one. We've gone an hour already, so we're, we're doing good. But you, very enlightening, very, I just amazed. I, I envy you for what you've done and, and things and just I'm thankful for what you've done for our country and uh, all these years later. Well, uh, it's, it's sad to me that you guys are leaving us and that some of the things you fought for, like you said, are going down. The yeah, it, it's very saddening, very saddening that, that the integrity is pretty low. Well, I'm trying to keep the memory alive, the history alive through this documentary series. And I've done five films on World War II, and I'm working on Korea and Vietnam too. But at the end of my interviews, Al, I asked the veteran to give me a salute into the camera from where you're seated. Will you do that when I tell you to? <laughs> you okay? I'll tell you when here. Okay, right into the camera. Go ahead. Thank you. Okay.